Hey, we're glad to see you on our another shocking story. Enjoy watching. It was the first days of June in the year 2002. It was very hot in the city. It seemed that this courtyard had never seen so many children before. There were kids of all ages running, jumping, and screaming with shrieking voices everywhere. Somewhere near the garages stood teenage boys, discussing Spartak's failed match, what had been shown on first TV the day before. On the playground loudly frolicking kids about five, five, seven years old. An older girl followed them with a business-like look, constantly interfering in their children's games so that they did not offend each other. On the benches sat a group of guys, by the look of middle school students, playing family games, throwing each other a red rubber ball. Bum! Shouting, one of the kids sharply threw the ball to his friend. There was laughter all around. The children were so loud that the grandmothers of the neighboring benches began to get annoyed. Get out of here, you fools! Aunt Pam got up from the bench and approached the boys. Why are you yelling, can't you see? There's little kids playing here. The boys wouldn't calm down. They laughed at Thomas, who had married an alcoholic and was homeless. Of course, it was all just a game, but still so funny that they laughed their stomachs off, ignoring the indignant look on Aunt Pam's face. Come on, Aunt Pam. We're out to here, said Andrew, the rowdiest boy in the yard. Get out. What kind of words do you use? I'm gonna talk to my mom again. Speak. Loudly, Andrew shouted after her, already leaving with his friends in the direction of the garages. The noisy company left the yard. They once again for swear words and loud shouting chased away by the storm of the yard and the elder of the house pan. What are we going to do, guys? Yawning asked Andrew. Let's go to the stone field, said William. Well, we'll decide on the way, said Andrew. The boys went wandering around the neighborhood in search of entertainment, which of course they arranged for themselves. But whatever they did during those hot summer days, they were the happiest kids in the world. After all, it was a vacation, and therefore it was freedom. The summer sky was slowly changing color, it was getting darker and darker. And yet, even at eight plus in the evening, it was still quite bright. Not even two hours ago. The courtyard had been full of children, which meant noise, shouting, and life. Now there were only two women smoking, one of whom was Pam, and two girls of about eight. They often stayed out late. The girls could go home at eleven o'clock at night, and their names were Kate and Mia. They became friends, as if somewhere in their subconscious feeling that they had a similar misfortune. The misfortune was disadvantage. The girls grew up in families with alcoholic parents, who almost never worked, surviving from bread to water at the expense of government handouts and money on loan from relatives and drinking buddies, and if Kate's parents were quiet, phlegmatic drunks, then Mia's dad and mom knew the whole yard. They liked to organize scandals in the yard, so that everyone could hear their swearing. It was quite a spectacle for the neighbors. Most of them looked out of their windows and balconies in a civilized manner and the rare few people tried to assuage the couple's grief. One of these brave women was Pam. She considered it a necessity to observe the situation in a place where children walked and adults rested. Often she had to deal with angry alcoholics in the middle of the night who decided to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with friends. She also dealt with suspicious teenagers who came to lie on the benches in a half-asleep state. And she was the one who kicked out the screamers and scandalizers who disturbed people's sleep on the night before the next working day. She was grateful, of course, but at the same time few people even tried to help Pam. Pam liked to discuss with the neighbors these two lonely girls who shunned other children and played in the yard until late at night. This fact disgusted and frightened her, but she didn't know how to help the little girls. What to do with them? What if some pedophile showed up here? She looked at Kate and Mia swinging on the swings, sharing her worries with her neighbor Lily from the second entrance. Lily was much more indifferent to the late-night outings of other neighbors' children. Come on, Pam. You're not missing anyone. Exhaling the smoke from her cigarette, Lily grinned. Oh, enough of me for all the pedophiles. There are little girls hanging around. Their clothes are all torn up, she said. 
Look at Anne. Look at Oliver. When was the last time they were sober? Pam took a deep puff and looked at Kate with a sad smile. Beautiful girl. So, so kind, so good. How could she be? Well, what if you look at these faces? You won't want to be like that. Lily said. Yeah, bedtime, Pam said. As usual, she went to the girls and asked them if it was time to go home. The kind-hearted woman knew it was not the right thing to do to send the girls home to drunk and therefore not quite adequate parents, but it was at the same time the least evil for them. Of the two options that existed at the moment, either Kate and Mia waited until it was so deep into the night that their parents were usually asleep, but risked running into dangerous people on the street, or they'd come early and run into drunken profanity at best, but were still relatively safe. Such alternatives for little innocent creatures upset Pam almost every day, but she couldn't do much more than that for them. The next day, the yard was again full of kids. In it, as on a large theater stage, the usual mise-en-scene for those who liked to look out of the window was lined up. Grandmothers were still sitting on the bench, teenagers were gathering near the garages, and small noisy children were playing on the playground. Even this noise was long ago accustomed to those around them. Another unpleasant incident broke all this order. Here it happened quite often. Mary, a girl about twelve years old, from a dysfunctional family, ran into the yard. She was followed by a large, red-haired, short-cropped woman in her fifties. She was clearly angry, her cheeks red with anger, and her eyes bulging spoke volumes about her emotional state. A bugua. These sounds, remotely resembling words, came out of her mouth and traveled across the courtyard of a deaf mute living somewhere nearby. Her name was May. She was often teased by the local boys, and some of them threw stones at her. That day she had a problem with Mary. The local grandmothers immediately stepped in, trying to stop May's rage. May. May, stop. The old women attacked the deaf girl. At first she waved them away, pushed their hands away. But then, saying something incomprehensible, sat down on a bench and calmed down. She took a breath. Still the grandmothers came closer to her. They saw May crying quietly. Come on, May be quiet. One of the old ladies put her arm around the deaf mute. May sat on the bench for a while, as if thinking about something. She took her dark blue typical bag, which was almost empty, and went on her way. Her friends Kate and Mia watched the scene with horror. They then had a long discussion with May and Mary about what she could have done to so offend the poor invalid woman. The girls, like the grandmothers on the bench, were hardy creatures. They never liked to see the weak and differently abused. And now they felt sorry for poor May, calling Mary a fool. The sun was shining brighter than usual. There were still many children, grandmothers and adults on the streets, already starting to party, drinking alcoholic beverages and not at all embarrassed by the large number of underage visitors to the yard. She saw the people, the playground and Mia from the bottom up. The girl was hanging on one of the yard's tourniquets. It was one of her favorite activities. Everything is upside down, she said to her friend with a giggle. Her blue t-shirt slid down and ogled her small baby belly. You can see the belly button, Mia laughed. Kate, who was hanging on the tent, was embarrassed and timidly took hold of the edges of her t-shirt and pulled it back up. The two little innocent angels were playing so carelessly and talking about all sorts of silly things on the playground, and everyone had stopped their eyes on them at least once. They were cute, and at the same time in the eyes of these two beautiful creatures there was already a lot of pain, and even a lot for seven-year-old girls. It got colder outside, and a strong wind blew. In a matter of minutes, the courtyard became completely quiet. Almost everyone went home. Thunder rumbled in the distance. A woman in her fifties sat on a bench. She was carrying bags. She was probably on her way from the store and sat down to rest. Maya and Kate ran around the yard, oblivious to the overcast weather and signs of an impending thunderstorm. The stranger on the bench smiled as she watched the little girls run around. The wind blew even harder. Sand soared into the sky. The girls squealed. Ouch, 
Sand in my eyes, screamed Kate. I'm going home, replied her friend. She quickly ran toward her driveway, looking around. Kate noticed only now. There wasn't a soul in the yard. This had happened before. So the girl said to herself, Well, here I am again alone here. The only one she noticed was some strange lady with bags. The girl decided to approach her. Hello, can I help you carry them? She asked the woman. Oh, come on. I can manage, my dear. What's your name? The stranger answered. Kate, I'm Mary. And where do you live? The child asked. Not far. I was just passing by your yard. Why aren't you home? Kate, look, what weather. The woman was surprisingly quick to pick up the conversation with a strange child. At the same time looking at her clothes, hands, and facial features with interest. Her expression changed from grim to smiling and interested. The girl was embarrassed. She was always trying to make conversation, so that it didn't descend into uncomfortable questions about her parents. And now, when she was asked about the reason for not wanting to go home, Kate thought sadly, she had to make something up again. She was silent for a long time. And Mary, noticing this childish, innocent embarrassment, answered, Go home anyway. There's a big hurricane coming. Look, the sand has already risen into the sky. I'm not afraid. A few years ago, when I was, I was what? I think four, I was left on the street alone. And it just started happening. Well, then they took me away. But I almost flew away. The girl animatedly recounted the events of that terrible hurricane of 1998 in Moscow but I immediately saw that you are a brave girl. Now run, Mary replied. Her face broke into a smile of delight. All right, Kate answered cheerfully. She walked slowly toward her house. The wind was still blowing. After a few more minutes, it started pouring rain in the city. Kate's parents, Anne and Oliver, were drunk and scandalous alcoholics. The family was on the books as dysfunctional and everyone knew their situation. The father and mother were quite young. Anne was 40 years old and Oliver was 42. In addition to Kate, a boy named Tim was growing up in the family. Where he disappeared in the summer vacation, his 14 years, no one knew. Well, or rather knew, but only the same no one needed, wandering in the yards of his friend's teenagers. They ran around the garages, played soccer, and drank beer asking the local strange man to buy them a couple or three cans at the liquor store. When Anne met Oliver, they were both quite decent people and didn't drink that much. But genetics took their toll. Oliver's father was a heavy alcoholic. He caught almost all of his scandals and fights with his mother, and one day it was as if he was turning into that man. Anne, being in an orphanage and therefore having no family model in front of her eyes, began to degenerate as a person. At first she drank with her husband so that he would drink less. Then she became addicted to alcohol. Having no higher education, they couldn't find a job that would suit them. And now every time one of them got a new job, not even a month passed before they were fired. So the family got used to living at the expense of the state and especially kind relatives of buddies who lent them money. One such person was Anne's sister Larry. The woman worked as an accountant in a construction company and could afford to give her sister a few thousand a month to support her favorite nephews. Mary came more often to this noisy courtyard full of unusual personalities and noisy children. Sometimes she was coming from the store, and sometimes she was just passing through and wandered in to sit and watch the carefree summer bustle of the children. She went around and around inside her mind for a long time. But when once again she saw the shy and blonde-haired girl Kate with her friend, she knew for sure she wanted to see her, and it wasn't just a feeling of pity for an abandoned child, it was something more. Pan liked to go out to her little canopy on the third floor, where catchpots with little purple flowers hung from ropes and wires, an ashtray, which was a tin can of sprat, had been converted to a parapet. From there she watched the life of the neighbors, and just smoked. On one of those lazy days when there was no reason to go out and just didn't feel like it, Pam saw Mary. 
She remembered that she had seen her before. She didn't like her presence in the yard. She doesn't talk to anyone. She's strange. What's the point of being here at all? The woman thought. Mary sat on a bench. She didn't have any shopping to do this time. She seemed to have come here purposefully, coming here for the umpteenth time. She'd never struck up a conversation with anyone. And to some people, she had already become familiar. Mary called out to Kate. She recognized the familiar face, and leaving Mia alone, she jumped up and ran up to Mary. Oh, hello. You're here again, she said with a childish, naive smile. Yes, I often come here now. I pass by, probably the fifth time I'm here already, replied Kate's new acquaintance. Come in. And you live nearby, don't you? Yeah, I do. You haven't been here in a while, have you? Kate was shyly silent. Mary realized that she had hurt the girl and hurried to reassure her. It doesn't matter. Well, not important. So the business was important. Who do you live with? Do you have a husband? Kate asked. No, I don't have a husband. What about kids? No kids either. Mary gloomed a little, but not for long. Next to her, twenty centimeters away from her sat a curious little beauty, who, like her, was interested in the life of her interlocutor. Kate, you tell me, what do you do in general? Do you go out with your friend? What else? Mary already knew what the girl had to face every day, and she was even a little unfair to her. This wasn't the fifth time she'd come here to the yard. She had been coming here for two whole months. The woman wanted to hear and see the noise and fun of the children. And if other adults sometimes resented such an environment for Mary, this yard was a fairy tale. Except that she saw the russet-haired girl with big blue eyes only for the second time. Not much of anything. I don't know. Kate hesitated, twirling a strand of her blonde hair around her finger. Sometimes we run around the garages. Oh, don't tell anyone. She covered her mouth with her hands, glancing at the woman in embarrassment. In the garages, barely concealing her indignation, Mary asked. That's dangerous. Kate, maybe we shouldn't, but Mia and I like it. But she cannot, said the girl. And you? I can do anything. The girl grinned ironically, so uncharacteristically for her age that Mary felt uncomfortable. She realized, of course, what the unhappy Kate was inclined to do. After this conversation, these two different, dissimilar souls became even closer. Every time the woman came into the yard, Kate threw herself on her neck with Mary's cries and hugged her tenderly, asking her about affairs. Mary told her that she worked as a doctor in a private clinic, that she loved to read and go traveling. Kate, who had never been farther than the nearby Moscow suburbs, loved listening to her new friend's stories about the pyramids of Egypt, the blue vast sea, and the big African elephant that dragged fascinated passengers sitting in Hindi right on its own back. Pam overheard one such lively conversation while standing on her favorite balcony with a cigarette. She realized that the girl's parents were probably in no condition to know about Kate's new friend, and felt it her duty to warn the woman away from the naive child. She saw Mary as evil. One day Pam decided to talk to her. Kate was no longer in the yard. Mary sat alone and stared at the burning windows of the houses. It was getting dark. She walked leisurely to the bench where the stranger sat and addressed her. Good evening. Hello. Mary replied. Pam at once thought there was fear and uncertainty in her voice. This feeling further solidified her suspicions. She thought nothing good of this woman. Do you live here, in these houses? Pam asked. A little farther away. I like to vacation here. Do you like the screams of our children? Pam laughed hostily. She sat down on the bench next to Mary and lit a cigarette. I like the kids. They don't annoy me. The stranger replied calmly. Do you especially like Kate? The abrupt transition from you to you seemed to Mary to show some hostility on the part of the interlocutor. What do you want, woman? I'm just socializing with the kids. They come to me. And you know, times are tough. And you know Kate's our kid. We're all watching her. And her parents are alcoholics. But we love that girl. And we're not gonna let her get hurt. I'm really happy for you guys. 
I don't know what you're getting at. Pan was a fan of watching the news on TV on cold, cloudy days when she didn't even want to go out on the balcony for a smoke. It wasn't uncommon for her to take a moment to look at her past torn heart and sigh. Perverts what's going on. At that time, it was not uncommon to hear news about pedophiles, maniacs, and people involved in such black businesses as illegal transplants, slavery, and drug trafficking. All of these puzzles in her mind formed an unpleasant picture, and she was now more worried than ever about the fate of abandoned children like Kate and Mia. Pam didn't bother to question Mary. She felt it was her duty to make her attitude toward the local children who were neglected and uncontrolled by their parents. Still, after the conversation, she left the yard with mixed feelings. Could this woman really just be a good-natured lover of children? But on the other hand, Pam had seen a lot of things in her life and once came to the conclusion that there is always evil, everywhere, and in everything. And now she did not understand the true intentions of the stranger, but as if she felt that there was something hostile in these intentions. Friday evening. It was as if there was a general picnic in the city. There were those who, without going out of town, or even to the park, celebrated the beginning of the long-awaited weekend in the hot days right in their yards. The guests of our yard were no exception. Shashlik, a cheerful and already slightly raised crowd of people did right on the urn, not so long ago painted in bright green color. Despite the fact that the time was no longer childish, there were still little kids running around the yard. They were the children of those very kebab makers, vigorously discussing the latest news in the country and in their own yard. Is she the right one? Is it the one who sat down? So he sat down again. How did he sit down again? 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 About such talk came to the innocent cats, the little children, but they, busy swinging on swings, running about, and playing at being criminals, did not pay much attention to the details of adult affairs, and only occasionally giggled among themselves when they heard swear words from drunken uncles and aunts. Kate was among these children. Her parents were very fond of summer vacations in the backyard. One of the reasons for the addiction to such pastime was the most common laziness and willlessness. Oliver and Anne did not like to go out for long periods of time beyond the yard or the grocery store, where they could buy inexpensive and tested alcohol. By eleven o'clock at night, all the adults celebrating Friday night in the yard were pretty drunk. Their children were still out for a walk. They sat down on a separate empty bench and whispered about something anxiously looking at the drunken group of people they knew. Instead of shish kebab cooking, it was noisier than it had been an hour before. If the children were quieter, the adults were louder. And it wasn't just talking, the kids realized. They were conflicted. The more alcohol these people put into themselves, the bolder, more determined, and most importantly, more aggressive they became. Oliver was the one who yelled the most. He was hurt by his friend's words, and he got into a fight with his fists. His wife, Anne, wanted to calm him down, but she realized that she could hardly stand on her feet, and she just did not have the strength to enter into the conflict between the men. Luckily, it didn't end in a fight. Oliver waved hysterically at his buddies, and Anne and Kate stood for a long time over his crouched figure, sitting on the bench, urging him to go home. The drunken father of the family had a half-empty bottle in his hands and was barely holding it. The family's entreaties had no effect on Oliver, and he barely got up from the bench and headed deeper into the houses, unbeknownst to him where he was going and why. The next day, Kate was approached by a crowd of boys and girls about twelve to thirteen years old. They were smiling evilly. Some had a look of embarrassment on their faces. Kate, I think your dad's in the driveway, one of them said, and the others giggled. What? No, said the girl thoughtfully and sadly. Yeah, yeah, there's your daddy lying drunk, shouted someone from the crowd. Go look. Kate didn't go to the entrance of that house. She felt hurt and sad. It was shame for her own man. She was being looked at and laughed at, talked over, laughed at. And what was her fault? 
Toward her father, she developed a grudge that day. But she didn't know what to do with that feeling. Kate had hoped for years that things would change for the better in their family. She wanted to stop one day seeing those endless bottles, cigarette butts lying around the apartment. Kate wished her brother Tim wouldn't be out on the streets with the boys so much. Would they all go to the movies together? She thought sometimes, of course. The little shy girl never shared her worries with her family or anyone else. The most painful thing for her was to see a well-to-do mother and father walking with their children, daughter, and son. She liked to observe such families closely, their habits, their gestures, their looks. Somewhere subconsciously, she tried to understand what was wrong with her family. It is difficult for an eight-year-old child to make complex conclusions, to philosophize about the causes of certain events that occur in life. Therefore, without making any conclusions, Kate continued to live as ordinary children live, playing with friends, studying at school, and of course, dreaming. Two weeks passed. Mary did not appear in the yard. Pam was telling the local grandmothers about how they had weaned her off the yard. Kate was constantly disappointed, passing all day in the yard, and not meeting this mysterious Aunt Mary, who, like a fairy godmother, came down to her from the fairy heaven. Only the girl got used to a new bright person in her life. Then that person disappeared. For her, it was a betrayal. But one day she came, dropping lightly onto a bench. A skinny, tall woman in a long blue dress and with a purse in her hands filled with groceries and exhaled heavily. It was as if she'd been carrying heavy weights all day. Kate, seeing her from afar, rushed toward the bench. The child's delight was unparalleled. Mary, shouted the girl, and sharply breaking fell right on top of the woman. They embraced and began to share with each other the news of the past days. Pan was not the only one. Many people did not understand this country of friendship and considered the stranger, if not dangerous to the girl, then very strange and strange. Mary herself at first could not answer why she had made friendship with this little girl. But these thoughts of doubt quickly transformed a clear purpose. Kate was no longer so much embarrassed to talk about her feelings, about her attitude toward her parents, and how sometimes she had to be ashamed of them. She had long considered whether to tell her about the unpleasant event that had happened with her father, because she had never before wanted to take the dirt out of the house and be frank about her family. But now that she felt that she had Mary's full confidence in her, her tongue was unbidden. Mary listened silently to Kate and asked her nothing for fear of hurting or offending her soul, and at the same time, she was a very attentive conversationalist. Kate sometimes wondered how she could remember such details of her stories. Such interest of her new friend bribed the girl. Mary, do you have a mother? Kate asked her. Sometimes, as is often the case with little children, she asked her companion the most sudden questions that stumped her. Yes, there is Kate. Why do you ask? No. I'm just asking. It happens. I just wanted to know. Mary was interested in everything about this girl. Even the most seemingly insignificant things were said by this lovely creature for a reason. And the woman began to slowly consider meeting her as fate. It happened one hot July afternoon. At first, Mia, Kate's friend, which was quite unusual for her, was walking alone in the yard. The local grandmothers were surprised by such an event. Mia, her aunt, called out to her. Why are you walking alone? Where's Kate? Kate was gone. I don't know. Finally, it got dark in the yard. Kate was gone. I wonder where Kate is. She and Mia walk together all the time. Pam wondered. I don't know. I'm still worried. Pam went to Kate's parents' house. Her heart wasn't in the right place. They didn't open the door right away. Anne was standing in the hallway in a stained green bathrobe with her hair in disarray. The picture before Pam was not the prettiest. Empty vodka bottles were everywhere. Oliver was lying on the bed, unconscious. Anne, where are the children? Pam asked worriedly. I mean, I don't get it. Tim, who is in the room playing, sits the little one. The woman's face took on a completely different expression in an instant. She seemed to remember that she had a little daughter who didn't come home as usual at 10 o'clock at night. 
Isn't she in the yard? And what yard? The time is eleven o'clock in the evening almost no longer is she in the yard, nor has she been. How? For the first time in a long time Kate's mother was in great anxiety. What was to be done now? Pan rested her arms at her sides, walking over to the window. It happens so often to people that they think better when they have the streetscape in front of them. She realized that by and large, the girl's well-being was in the interest of only herself and to some extent Anne. Even though the alcohol had destroyed almost all of her personality, she needed to help this woman, and most importantly, to help Kate escape. The first thing that came to Pam's mind was that the mysterious Mary could have harmed the girl. Now it remained to figure out where to find this Mary. No one knew where she lived, only that she was known to be nearby. Tim came out of his room. The boy looked sleepy. He had probably just gotten out of bed and had no idea what the neighbor was doing here or why his mother was in such a state. Hi, Aunt Pam. What's wrong? Mom. He looked at his mother questioningly. Kate's missing. Missing how? We have to look for her right away. After saying that, Tim went to change his clothes. He was right in thinking that there might not be much time left, and then there would be nothing to do. So he decided to act at once. Two minutes later, the boy came out into the living room. He looked at his father lying on the bed. He was in a half-asleep state the loud talking had almost woken him up. He realized that it was about his daughter, but he also realized that he didn't feel like getting up or going out. And his excuse to himself was, Anne will figure it out. Tim looked at his mom and Aunt Pam. They were the only ones in the world who felt real concern for the girl. The boy spoke firmly. We have to get out. In a minute the three of them were outside and had absolutely no idea where to go. It was all her, that thing. I've been told that she's been picking on her, Anne lamented. What beast are you talking about? Asked the boy. Yes, Mary, the woman. She and Mia and Kate hang out in the yard. What? What does she want with little kids? Rascal, bastard. I think I know who we're talking about. Me and the boys once saw her go into a house with some kind of archway, Tim remembered. Yes, it's not for nothing that you've been going around, Tim, his mother said with a bitter smile full of worry. Let's go there quickly. Anne had sobered up completely in the last ten minutes. Her perpetually detached gaze had changed to a look of complete middling concern and a desire to find her daughter. It was a short-lived transformation into a real mother, willing to make any sacrifice for her child. The three almost jogged to the very house where Mary supposedly lived. Pam and Anne knew an elderly woman from that driveway. Of course, she was already peacefully asleep at the time, but there was nothing to be done. A child's life was at stake. They called apartment number five. Polly, open up, please. Are you freaks crazy? Can you see the time? The voice of an old lady approaching the door. Polly, it's Pam. My daughter's missing. Pam said impatiently. There was complete silence in the apartment. A moment later there was a rustle and a heavy sigh from the landlady. She muttered faintly. All right now. Let me get the door. The door was opened by a short woman of about seventy-five. Her face was sunken with traces of her former beauty. Her gray hair was rather short, but her evenly trimmed bangs, which adorned and ennobled her aged face, caught the eye. She looked good-natured and calm. But what am I, my darlings? I haven't seen your daughter. I rarely go out, replied Polly. Do you know where Mary lives? A woman in her fifties. She's been here a while, Tim asked. What about her? Why are you here? I know, but she has nothing to do with it. How do you know, Grandma? Anne began. The son hurried to calm the nervous mother, who had been on edge ever since she learned of her daughter's disappearance. Mom, stop it. It's not about that. Mary lives one floor above me. But don't touch her. She's here to help me and feed the kitties. Polly was gonna say something else, but her uninvited guests were already hurrying up to the third floor. Mary opened the door almost immediately. Good evening. What can I do for you? She didn't say a word to her hostess. 
Anne, who was standing in front of her, pushed her back into the hallway and walked briskly into the room. Mary understood. She did not resist or disturb these people. She understood they had come looking for her beloved Kate. A few seconds later, Pam and Tim came in as well. All three of them had been looking for the girl in Mary's apartment, but saw that not only was she not here, but there was no sign of her. May I ask what or who you are looking for in my apartment? Mary pronounced, breaking the silence of the desperation of the girl searchers. We were looking for my sister Kate. Sorry, we thought you had her, Tim replied sadly. How did Kate go missing? Not that. The woman was surprised. What do you know? Pam replied sharply. Her attitude toward Mary was still prejudiced. I've been talking to the girl. She told me different stories. What did she tell you? Tell me, we're going to lose her. Anne turned emotionally to the woman and with her hands on her head, slumped down on the blue couch against the wall. She talked about some cars on sticks, saying she really wanted to go there, but didn't know who to go with. Anne, Aunt Pam, and Tim looked at each other. They all realized what cars were being talked about. It was the local attraction near the Oriental movie theater. Almost at a run, they headed toward the place. Pam, please go, go home. Anne begged the woman, out of breath. She could see that Pam was in no condition to move that fast. And still she tried. Yes, Aunt Pam. We'll find Kate on our own now. We'll tell you everything right away. All right, screw it. I'm gonna go. Don't wait up. The old woman of 67 slowly took a step and sat down on a bench outside the apartment building. If only she could be found alive, she thought. Her heart was both fearful and painful for this child lost in every sense. Now there were two of them. The people closest to them were looking for Kate, they got to the rides that were about to close. Have you seen a little girl around here? They turned to the vacationers. Anne and her son began to describe her, but everyone was silent. Suddenly one of the noisy group of young people asked, Was she alone? We don't know. There was a girl. Looks like yours. They left about five minutes ago. She was with a man. What man? Anne cried out. Which way did they go? To these five-story buildings, the young man pointed to the gray paneled houses rising among the other buildings. Even more worried, mother and son ran toward the houses. They both knew one of them was a dormitory. Upon reaching that building they rushed into the courtyard. To their delight, they saw Kate there, standing next to a suspicious man in his thirties. You bastard! Get away! Get away from my baby! I'll call the police, you bastard! Anne threw herself at the man, and he ran away. As far as the eye could see, Tim moved toward him, but his mother shouted, Tim, stop. The boy obeyed. You can't catch up anyway. Let the thing run. At home, the unfortunate Kate was waiting to talk to her mother, and her father, who had already sensed something wrong, awakened. After half an hour of screaming at the girl, her parents left her and went to bed. The clock in the living room read twelve. The next day, Kate did not leave the house. Mary was worried about her. She sat in the yard for a long time, and then, when she saw Aunt Pam come into the yard, she rushed to her at once. Pam, hello. I'm sorry. I'm very worried about Kate. What's wrong with her? Did you find her? Yes, we did. She's fine. Pam hasn't been very forthcoming. So where is she? Meet us playing alone again. I don't know. What's it to you? What do you care about other people's little kids? Why are you talking to me like that? What right do you have? Mary was indignant. I don't understand. I just don't understand why you want this girl. She's not your daughter. She's not your relative. You don't know her parents. What do you want? I know Kate. She's an eight-year-old girl. You're not her company. What do you want from her? Mary kept repeating the same question. But Mary didn't want to play the role of the self-justifying defendant trying to prove her innocence. Her parents are alcoholics. They almost lost the girl. What if I hadn't been there? Pam remained silent. She realized that there was truth in the woman's words. Mary continued. 
I've grown to love this girl, and I'm worried about her. I see how hard things are for her. She won't even go home when it gets dark. You see all this and you say to yourself, they're other people's kids, don't get involved. But I'm just talking to her, to you. Her mother's drunken face and her abusive father are the best thing for the girl. Are you asking me what I want? What do you want? What do you want from me? Do you want me to stop talking to her? Would that make her life easier? I don't know. I sense danger in you. Kate just needs a friend. She needs someone who will listen to her and understand her. I would never hurt her. But her own parents, they're abusers. They could be dangerous to her. They're her parents. Annie is her mother. You have no right to discuss her. Why don't you take care of your own children? Pam didn't choose to talk about this because she didn't understand basic ethics. When you don't know someone, you don't bring up serious topics without knowing anything about their fate. No, she asked the question because she wanted to bring Mary out into the open, to understand what motivated her to communicate with Kate. It's my private life, and I don't have to answer to anyone. All I'm saying is that Kate's in danger. I want to do something to help her. Both women were left with their own opinions and feelings after the conversation, but Mary was more right that day than ever. What's more, her words were prophetic. Kate did not leave the house, and the next morning and evening, she had not been seen for over a week since she had met a man in the street near the yard, who was extremely dangerous to small children. She had met death itself, which she, thanks to a new friend named Mary, Aunt Pam, and her own mother and brother, had managed to avoid. But nothing good awaited the girl at home, and life there had not changed for the better. In the morning, the father and mother were even angrier and more aggressive than at night. They had both sobered up. Anne told her husband about Kate's adventures in detail, and he was determined to teach his daughter a lesson. These individuals did not want to think about the fact that their daughter was first and foremost a small unintelligent child who required attention, care, and most importantly, education. They wanted to take out their anger and dissatisfaction with life on Kate. That's it. Even the day before, having found herself in a terrible trouble, having avoided it the next day, the girl got into a new one. The parents had waited for the usual departure of the 14-year-old son from home, beat the girl, and, of course, didn't hit the child hard. She more shouted and controlled the actions of a scoundrel husband who heartily beat his own child in belt and bare hands. After a while, the perverts realized that the girl had not been out of bed for a long time. They found traces of blood on the pillow. Kate had to go to the hospital. She received serious beatings. Cruel parents worried not a little for the girl's health, but for the fact that they will have to answer for their actions before doctors, and maybe even before the court. Before going to the hospital, of course, they had to come up with some sort of legend that would explain such severe injuries on little Kate's face and body. The doctors in the emergency room looked at each other. They weren't just looking at the baby. The appearance of her parents made them realize the girl had been beaten by them. The young medic smiled at her colleague. It was, of course, a smile of irony. How many times had they encountered similar tales of a bad fall or a collision with a lamppost? Meanwhile, the nature of the injuries was obvious. It was a beautiful hot summer. On a July day, cheerful and noisy, Kate lay in her bunk at the children's hospital and looked out the window, dreaming of getting out of those gloomy, unpleasant four walls sooner. The only thing she was grateful to this place for was the temporary protection from her hated relatives. She missed her friend Mia, the other neighborhood kids, even though she didn't interact with them much. Kate was already starting to reminisce about school. She wanted to go to third grade. She was also thinking about her adult friend Mary and wondering if she would be worried about her absence. She was really worried about this stranger's feelings. She was not such a stranger to her now. On the contrary, there was something native in her voice, her look, her smile. Despite all the care of doctors about little Kate, at the moment of discharge, she was almost healthy but she could not regain her original aesthetic appearance. Still on her face were bruises and dribbles. But the girl did not worry about it, 
because ahead was a meeting with her dear and close people. After the beatings at home, Kate began to appreciate the friendship with Mia and Mary even more. She stepped out into the courtyard. All eyes that day were directed toward her. And even though Kate was a little girl, she could feel everything. Her bruises were looked at with special attention and interest. Hi. The friend hurried to hug the girl. Hi, Mia. I missed you. Oh, what's wrong with you? Did someone beat you up? I fell. Oh, that's a pretty bad fall, huh? Yeah. Aunt Mary asked about you a lot. She was worried. I know she was. But it's okay. We'll see you soon. Mia kept asking about the details of the fall. Of course, she didn't realize that she was hurting her friend and that she was making up stories as childishly and ineptly as she could. Kate had not been so uncomfortable and hurt in a long time. She caught herself in a difficult and unchildish thought. I already have to lie to hide all these nightmares from others. And along with that, she firmly decided, I don't want to lie like this for the rest of my life. But as usual, she didn't know what to do to make her life, which was still just beginning, change for the better. Mary was not in the yard that day, and this fact upset Kate. Still, she was glad to be back in such a familiar and native place as the yard. At the same time, when she looked at the entrance of her own house, she became gloomy and depressed. Even her legs shook, and with all her soul and body she wanted to stay away from that place. When she, having remained in the yard, as always almost last, still headed for the entrance, she felt how bad thoughts overpowered her. Panic was setting in. Each step was given to the girl with heaviness, as if more and more shackles were chained to her feet. She stood near the front door for about five minutes, thinking, I don't want to go there, I really don't want to go there. I'd rather live on the street or at Aunt Mary's. I don't want to live with them. I hate them. Why isn't Aunt Mary my mom? It would have been better for everyone. It was the first time the girl had ever had a thought that was so strange, yet so logical. To live at Aunt Mary's, she did not want to impose on anyone and realized that her thoughts would not turn into reality. Meanwhile, the gynecologist who had long ago become lonely and unhappy and who counseled pregnant women and women planning pregnancies, lay in her dark room on a soft couch and stared at a black dot on the ceiling. Her eyes were so focused, as if she was contemplating her future life in that dot. In fact, she was. She liked to think, dream, fantasize. On a weekday after work, and, as a rule, all her even well-intended thoughts ended in painful self-examination and reminiscences of past mistakes. So she began with a vague future and ended with a heavy past, which every now and then pressed on her an incomprehensible weight. Now, however, her usual thoughts were often displaced by thoughts of a small but very bright ray of sunshine named Kate. She was disturbed by the sudden disappearance of the girl, but still she was always glad to think of her and the innocent nonsense she loved so much. Their meeting took place nearly two weeks after the next time they saw each other. Mary, meeting the girl near their favorite shop, was both pleased and distressed, but she did not question her about anything. Kate, as usual, began to tell about her love for butterflies, about the bright star she had seen the day before in the sky, about her classmates, and that she wanted to go to school and thought how difficult it would be for her to study in the third grade. Mary, like the girl herself, acted as if her little friend's face hadn't changed, though it was difficult for her in her heart. As Kate told her her next stories, she had conjectures, conclusions, and possible solutions. It was them. It was her inadequate parents. Spun around in the angry woman's mind, only, just like Kate, she had no way out of this terrible situation, in which an innocent child suffered and had long since chosen as her shelter the streets of the neighborhood, in which dysfunction and danger reigned. Always those girls snooping around, the locals said of Kate and Mia. They didn't like it, and they understood the reasons for the girls' new wanderings on the street, but no one wanted or saw any point in doing anything to help them. And why should they? The little girls had parents, 
which meant that everything that could happen to the children was on their conscience. Well, yeah, fair enough. The first person who really took an interest in Kate's predicament was Mary. She was lonely. Her husband had left her not too long ago. They'd been married for twenty years, a decision that had been extremely difficult for the two of them, especially Mary. She loved William. She gave him all the home comfort, warmth, love, care, but most importantly, from some time for William was to hear, finally, the cries of a baby in their beautifully furnished but so quiet apartment. Mary was fifty-two. The last few years had been the most active for her in terms of having a baby. She had convinced herself and her husband that everything would work out, even at such an inappropriate age for childbearing. A year ago, William gave up. You're fifty-one years old, Mary. Do you realize it's a shame to have children at that age? What? Ashamed. Mary turned to her husband quietly, timidly, and at the same time with a slight note of complaint. You mean you're ashamed of me? Mary, you're not. I'm just tired already. Of what? I'm forty-seven. You're fifty-one. We should just calm down, you know. All I know is that we can't give up. So much money has been spent on this. Exactly, William said. What's the point? It's no use. This conversation was particularly bitter for the woman. They had been married for so many years and now, after the hurtful words, the union had every chance of falling apart after many years. William also worked in the field of midwifery. Lately, it had become hard for him to do this important business of delivering babies to women, because his beloved had never given him a child. The decision to leave Mary was not easy for him, but he did not make it overnight. William simply postponed it for another year. He loved her, but her prolonged hopeless infertility sometimes upset him to such an extent that the only solution he saw was separation. William felt himself growing colder and colder to his wife, to her problems, to her successes, and even her joys when she smiled and laughed. All he did was squeeze a smile out of himself. Fifty-two-year-old gynecologist, M.D. Mary, of course, saw the changes in her lover, but she didn't want to accept them. She let him go with the thoughts that he, like her, was tired of being devastated. At first, Mary was supportive of her former spouse, called him and inquired about his mood, his health. But things change. In a moment, she learned that her own beloved William was getting married for the second time, and the chosen one was a young girl nurse named May. Mary knew her. They often saw each other in the residence room. The girl was sweet and modest. She was pretty, but she was immature. She had no idea that a certain nonverbal relationship had already been established between them that little by little was destroying her already shaky marriage. Mary later learned that May was pregnant. She made a difficult decision for herself that day. She moved from the neighborhood where she and William had met and lived, where she had worked for over a decade. A private clinic had long beckoned to her, and she, as if sensing that these people would be useful to her one day, had not turned them down, citing her inability to get a job with them due to various difficulties. Mary found it hard to breathe, again and again stumbling over information about her ex-husband's private life. It became unbearable. William tried to avoid her, though, so as not to hurt her feelings. They worked in the same place, which meant that meetings, though rare, were inevitable. She moved to a less affluent neighborhood, but it was geographically convenient for her daily commute. It was here that she first saw this little girl, who touched the most delicate strings of her soul. The thought of children never faded in her mind. She still wished to have a child, and even planned to go to an orphanage. But acquaintance and further sweet, kind communication with Kate postponed this trip. She was no longer interested in other children. For her, as for other real moms, they were strangers' children, and Kate had become her own so imperceptibly and quickly. Another, already less tense conversation with Pam seemed to gather all Mary's thoughts into one decision. She didn't know what she'd heard from her neighbor, but she felt she understood everything. You again? asked Mary approaching, holding the bags in her hands. It's me again. You know, 
I live right here in the neighborhood. Maybe I can't sit in the neighbor's yard now. You're starting to act as weird as I am if you want to. Okay, that's enough of that. Where do you go grocery shopping? Flavor City. We all go to the 10 instead of the meetings. Well, I can go there. The woman I was talking to answered indifferently. Clearly she was thinking about something else, was not very concentrated on the conversation. There was silence between the women. A light summer breeze ruffled the blonde strands of Mary's crabbed hair. She was staring off into the distance, toward the noisy roadway. Mary, are you married? I'm not. And children? Mary didn't answer. Pam didn't bother asking her. She suddenly thought of Kate's family. And these alcoholics are our two children, Kim and Kate is your favorite. And Anne is from the orphanage. Orphanage? Mary asked thoughtfully. Oliver's ours. I remember him as a little boy. He was twenty-five. We had a wedding. We partied all night. Went to a restaurant. It was so steamy. I don't know where he found her. And then they sucked on a bottle. And that was it. There's a lot of them around here. It's just the scandalous ones. Mary eagerly caught every word Aunt Pam said, looking for salvation and a way out of the situation. And when she got home with bags full of food and lay down on her blue couch, she began to have intrusive thoughts. Anne is an alcoholic, from the orphanage. Kate doesn't know her grandmother. So, why are you telling yourself all this? No, what the hell is that? It's August. The kids were starting to feel a little more strongly about school. Some were anxious, some were happy. And there were those who were especially pragmatic, who thought that it would be good to use the last summer days to the fullest and not to think about the future. But as it got significantly colder outside, neighbors smoking on the balcony no longer observed such a noisy and large crowd of children in the yard. It became noticeably quieter and calmer. It was a quiet, calm, and cool day. Kate went outside in a light pale green jacket. Mia wasn't outside. She was walking alone, daydreaming. And every once in a while, she changed her stride to a sprint. Her mind was whirling merrily with childish, funny, ridiculous, and simply amusing thoughts. Mary came in later. She called out to the girl. Kate, hi. How are you? Mary, hi. I'm good. How are you? She walked up to her friend and saw that she looked puzzled. Mary had been really thoughtful in the morning and afternoon at work. And now that she'd met Kate. Mary, you look sad, the child said. I'm just brooding. Oh my goodness. About what? About you, Kate. I think about you a lot now. About me. What's there to think about? After a moment, the woman said uncertainly, You're just like me. Yes, you like butterflies and stars too. The girl smiled. No, my girl, that's not the only thing you and I are alike. You're my kin. My kin. You, my kin. Kate did not understand what the enigmatic Mary was getting at. Mary was silent. She was embarrassed. What she, having already thought over several times what had been long ago decided, was now so difficult to voice to this little trusting angel how she did not want to deceive her. I am your grandmother. Quietly, she said. But you can't be. Saying these words loudly, the girl took a deep breath and covered her mouth with her palms. I don't have a grandmother. I don't have a mom. She's from the orphanage. I know, Kate, your mom was taken from me a long time ago. And now I found you. Tim, you, my daughter. Your mom upset me. I don't want to know anything about her. 11006. Does she hurt you? So mom doesn't know about you? No, but you know everything now. Mary wanted to make one very important and unexpected suggestion to the girl, but restrained herself, figuring she'd had enough information today that was not only shocking but false. This woman had suffered a lot in her life. It had been a long agony, despite her efforts in righteous living, to be faced with the fact that she could not once again have a child. A big and sharp blow was the betrayal of her husband. Of course, all these events affected Mary, and she was no longer the same. Morally, the moral boundaries within her were erased, 
It seemed that she was ready for the most any stupid, rash, and terrible step. She thought long and hard about the neglected blue-eyed girl named Kate, and finally, she had made up her mind. She was going to steal her away from her family. Mary was at the stage of thinking over her actions. She had no right to make a mistake. A mistake meant a complete failure in her life. Closing the last door to personal happiness, if only at this late date. In her case, it meant imprisonment. Mary knew if she was caught, she wouldn't survive the shame of prison. Careful and cautious. The resident of the house with the archway wasn't just watching Kate. She already knew quite a bit about her parents, her brother, those who might have caused the threat. One of them was Aunt Pam. Mary learned that the grief-stricken parents had been on a terrible bender as of late and saw and understood little of the world. Tim came home less and less often. Rumors that Anne and Oliver were in an inadequate state spread from bench to bench. From yard to yard, with the speed of the first August leaves falling to the ground, everyone knew the couple hadn't left the house in weeks, unless it was to replenish their alcohol supply, which was vital to them at the time. On the day of the false confession, Mary was still a little doubtful about the correctness of her act and further plans. She sat at home in the semi-darkness and pondered. But to each of her inner questions, she found the answer that was the justification she so desperately needed. That night, she was like a schismatic who divided people into those who trembled and those who had a right. Mary asked herself questions, why am I afraid to deprive the girl of suffering? Does she really have a right to have and raise children? Where is the justice? As time went on, questions became fewer and fewer, and in their place were now mostly assertions that Mary, of course, believed to be correct. Alcoholics, not human beings. Kate has a right to be happy, and I will make her happy. Why have I been tormented all my life? Why is it fate that I have no children? I've done everything for this. Shall I not be rewarded for it and have an outlet? Mary interrupted her heavy thoughts with a cry. She felt unbearably sad and afraid. She feared for herself in case of failure. She feared for the girl in case something within her should tremble. And she would leave it at that. But she wiped away her tears and looked at the homemade bracelet of small colorful glass balls that Kate had given her the day before. I'm going to save this girl, no matter what. They met again. Kate knew where her adult friend lived. And Mary invited her over. It was early weekend morning, about eight o'clock or a little earlier. That way the risk of being seen by the locals was reduced many times over. Mary was afraid Kate wouldn't want to go far away for a long time, and with a stranger from her family. Tim she loved, though she rarely saw him. She loved the place she lived in. She also loved the school and the teachers. Thoughts of the girl's possible disagreement were now perhaps the only obstacle to her goal. Mary looked at Kate. Her bruises were almost gone. The girl had been surprisingly cheerful that day. So you didn't tell anyone, like I asked you to. Kate, what's wrong with you? No, Kate whispered. Kate, I have something serious to talk to you about. I just need you to think about it. Okay. The girl looked intently at Mary. Kate, I want us to go away. Go to my place. It's a place in the country. For good? The girl asked. She was even more surprised and confused than she had been when she heard that the mystery woman happened to be a grandmother. This question was one of those questions that Mary had not at all thought through what was best for her to answer. To lie again, or to tell it as it was. She didn't want to lie to the girl again after that big deception. But her reaction scared her. Kate was frightened, and there was a sudden sadness in her eyes. She was a child, after all, and her parents, no matter how they sometimes acted, were her family. More importantly, she loved her brother Tim. Not for a year, maybe two, I want to, and then later. Then we'll come over. What will mom and dad say? They'll fight. I've discussed it with them. Unfortunately, there's no time for goodbyes. If we don't leave now, we'll never leave. Make up your mind. The girl stared at the floor for a long time. Occasionally she looked at Mary, but Mary just stared at the unhappy child whose life would change dramatically in a moment. 
And what was wildest of all, she had to decide her fate here and now. All right. Sighs. We'll go. I've decided. Mary exhaled deeply, trying to hide her extreme satisfaction at the mental work she had done. The woman had already prepared all the warm clothes, summer shoes, hygiene products, books, snacks for the trip, all of which fit into a dense bag and a large backpack. Mary didn't want to attract attention with a big bulky suitcase. Her task was to get out of the city with the baby as discreetly as possible. They boarded a bus first, then another, then a third. This, too, was part of the caution. There was no need to show any identification on the bus, because it was dangerous to leave any trace in the form of information about oneself. Mary had distant relatives she had visited when she was young. It was a village far from the city. Not abandoned, but dying. Mostly old people lived there. And life there had a slower and more measured pace. No one quarreled or fought there. People went about their everyday life and went to the store five kilometers away from home, talked among themselves on benches, and sometimes just admired the view from the window, watched birds perched on the branches of trees and sunsets. If someone had the habit of coming here every ten years, that person would not notice that anything had changed. Even the villagers seemed the same. After decades, there was a magic to this place. The townspeople called the village by the humble name of Buki the Bermuda Triangle. Kate, to the delight of her new grandmother, in the first days of life in the village, showed herself as a child not fastidious and not picky. Let the atmosphere here was calm and quiet. But the eight-year-old girl had quite a hard time reorganizing her habitual regimen. Mary drew water for the two of them at the well. Bathing had to be done in a narrow wooden house with a wooden floor. There was an old soap dish on a stand. There was a bar of white soap stuck to it, which had already turned to stone, and it was impossible to wash properly. Fortunately, Mary had all the necessary hygiene products with her. She was chopping wood to heat the house. It was a most amusing sight for the town Kate. She'd seen wood chopping, of course, but only on TV. And they were all strong, sturdy men. And here was her grandmother doing such unladylike labor. After a couple of days of living in the cottage, which was, by the way, despite all the inconveniences, quite cozy for living in it, Mary and Kate had a conversation. The woman wanted once more to secure herself and her from the people who would certainly be looking for them. Glasses of delicious herbal tea were left on the table. Kate returned to the house after a hike to a nearby grove. So, did you find the mushrooms? Only one girl sadly showed a small Podberezovic to her grandmother. Do not worry, here comes the fall. We'll go with you to the forest. We'll get plenty of them. Kate sat down at the table. She took the glasses in her hands and began to blow off the steam coming from the hot herbal tea, inhaling with her nostrils its beautiful forest smell. Mary looked at the girl and thought about the fact that she was still in danger. What if people came? What if word of the girl's disappearance was already going around the country? She remembered the look in her eyes, the sobered mother ready to kill for her Kate when she came to her house. What was she capable of? She didn't know. She needed to be reassured. As calm and detached as the people of the Buicks were, anything could happen. Kate, I want to ask you something, Mary said timidly. Kate had already taken a couple of sips of tea and was eating a cookie. Aha! The girl answered carelessly. Could you call me mommy? Kate could not answer this question at once. A week ago, the person sitting across from her was just Mary. A few days ago, her own grandmother. Now she was asking for something more difficult for a young child to understand. I know it's hard, but it's necessary. But I have a mom. Mary didn't try to persuade the girl. She decided that she herself would indirectly encourage Kate to do so. Now she addressed her not only as Kate, but also as daughter. She looked quite young for her fifty-two years. And subsequently, Kate, it was not so wild to one day still address her mother. Kate's appearance, too, had undergone a change. Her long hair, coming down to her elbows, was now short, and its tips barely touched her shoulders. Meanwhile, while Kate and Mary sipped tea in the rustic, stove-heated cottage, 
The couple had just noticed that their daughter had disappeared from the house and had not appeared for more than three days. Tim helped them to make such a conclusion. The boy had also been hanging around with his friends all this time, and it so happened that he just ran from the corridor to his room and only spent the night there and also quickly went out in the morning. The boy was influenced by a drinking party. There were sixteen-year-olds among them, and all of them had long ago known about beer, vodka, and brandy firsthand. Tim became bored just hanging around the streets of the neighborhood, and he joined the older guys. Now his summer routine consisted of fun drinking with older guys and girls, mopeds and alcohol. Tim had felt something wrong for three days, but he couldn't figure out what was wrong. He was already living his own life, where there was almost no room for family, and though he loved Kate, he had forgotten about her for a while. The day he decided to relax at home for a while and play an online game with his friends, the older brother remembered that his little sister did not annoy him as before, did not ask him about anything, and did not ask to sit at the computer. He didn't see her in the yard when he came home. Tim went into his parents' room. They were both half asleep. Mom, Dad, where's Kate? Anne got up on the bed and stretched out her sleepy eyes with her palms. Kate, Oliver, Oliver, have you seen Kate today? The man, awake still didn't understand what the housemates wanted him to do. Oliver, Kate, Kate's missing. Don't you get it? His wife screamed at him. She's gone. She's not missing. She's walking around the yard. From despair and indifference, Oliver Ann slowly sank into a chair and wrapped her arms around her head. What a nightmare, Kate. It was the first time she had ever cried for her daughter, and she risked never seeing the girl again and something told her that now there would be no happy ending, just as it had been when they had searched for Kate with Tim and Pam. On the day they realized Kate was missing, the district police had been raised by them, and the very next day the whole of Moscow was busy looking for the little girl. Across the city on almost every post and on every bulletin board hung a black and white portrait of Kate, beautiful, blue-eyed, girls with a kind smile, and gorgeous long blonde hair. The case of missing eight-year-old Kate quickly spread across the country. Every region was involved in the search for the missing girl to one degree or another. Of course, when visiting the police station, they never forgot to mention a certain Mary, who for a while lived in a neighboring house and was friends with Kate. She's the one who stole the girl. I know for a fact she must be found, said the desperate woman. But it turned out that Mary lived in the apartment illegally, and no documents were provided to the landlord. A second case arose, and the police began searching for the owner of the apartment. All these problems further distanced Mary from the kidnapper's trail. It turned out that no one could say anything about this woman. Especially, the police did not want to develop a person who was not seen for anything criminal. Except that the communication with the little girl was not clear to anyone including the investigators. They sat in a small stuffy office with old furniture and a computer that had already fallen behind the modern technology, turned on once in a while and discussed the case. There were two of them, Alex, a young investigator, and Mike, a senior police lieutenant. But what does she want from us? Angry as a beast. It's her own fault the girl's missing. You can see from her face that she was beating her. Well, Mike, we gotta find the kid. Who we got in the pipeline? No one. You remember what that broad said about that sketchy janitor who left with the girl? I think that's him. And Mary is some kind of fairy tale creature. Basically, if we work hard enough, we can find her. We could do a sketch based on the mother's description, canvas the neighborhood. Alex, let's not do this yet. Let's just keep looking for this creep for now. And that's for just hanging out with the little one. Are we gonna bring everybody up now? I think after those two words Alex stopped talking. What could be the cost of revelations that he suddenly wanted to say? What do you think? It seems to me that if they were looking for the daughter of some local oligarch, they would have found Mary and anyone else. Alex is still young. Lieutenant Mike's conclusion was completely inappropriate and ill-considered. It carried no hidden meaning. 
except that Alex was really physiologically young. With such phrases, the chief subdued the ardor of energetic employees, who, as he believed, did not yet know real life. So the investigators agreed that Mary should be excluded from the suspects, especially since they had no information about her. Mary's been alive for a month. Kate was never one to lose her guard, always on the lookout. When she went into town to get the necessary supplies, she came across a photograph with a familiar face on one of the lampposts. It was Kate. The woman felt uneasy. She found the nearest bench and sat down on it. But here I am, a criminal. I stole someone else's child. But how unfair life is. Mary, in general, had lately become more and more in tune with the inner self that had once pushed her to deceive Kate and later to kidnap her. She played the role of a savior, sincerely not understanding and not accepting the outside world and people around her. All people seemed to her not decent, evil, and worthy only of punishment and retribution. And she also fell in love with the word fate. Everything that happened to her and her Kate, she called this word. But none of it was a dialogue with her friends or co-workers. It was a dialogue with herself. It wasn't that Mary had no one to talk to. She was afraid to make eye contact with people in whom she saw only hostility. The town Mary traveled to was small. The local police knew about the village of Bwicky, but they did not disturb this small world cut off from civilization. We won't stick anything in the boys. There is nothing there to scare the locals with all sorts of passions, the head of the department told his charges. Three months passed. The cold November came. Nature was withering away, so that one day, after a long wait, to rise and reward all living things with the variegated colors and fragrant smells of spring. Tim was returning from school. He was no longer part of the company of those drinking boys. Interacting with them, he felt, had fatally affected his life and that of his family. He walked down the dark alleys of the streets, and his heart ached with pain. Tim thought of his sister again. How little time I spent with her. I should have been watching her and helping her. I hate you. The boy had never been fond of his parents, but now he would come home to lock himself in his room until morning and head off to school again. A strange feeling visited the lad. It was as if Kate had ceased to exist for him. He still hoped that she would show up one day, but that hope was fading with each passing day. He walked into the hallway. The apartment was quiet. Street concerts, squabbling and shouting coming from the neighboring courtyard, had not been heard by the neighbors for a long time, and in general now about them less and less remembered by the locals. Only the grandmothers, seeing the gloomy Anne walking toward the liquor store, murmured among themselves discussing the hard fate of the woman. What a pity for her, they said. And only Pam did not consider this character a victim. Only she as if she knew something and was never embarrassed at the sight of Kate's mother walking down the street, while the child was being searched all over the city and people were discussing this horrifying event. She was calm. Tim, is that you? A muffled voice came from the kitchen. It was Mom. Tim didn't answer anything and headed towards his room. Tim call his mother even more quietly. The boy reluctantly walked into the kitchen. He saw a pathetic creature that very roughly resembled a woman. Anne's face was rougher and covered with numerous wrinkles and puffiness. Her hair, as usual, was unwashed and unkept. She smelled as if she hadn't showered in a week. Maybe she hadn't. Have you heard anything new? No. Do you think sh she'll be back? I don't know. Tim exhaled. Sit down. Tim sat down across the table. There was an ashtray on the table. One of the steers was still emitting its only cigarette smoke. The boy saw a tear on his mother's cheek. She rested her fist, sobbing, looking at the floor. Kate, my daughter. Tim was in a state of stupor. He felt sorry for his mother, but the feeling of pride never left him. The boy realized that all those tears and worries were the payment for once abandoning and leaving the one who needed them all. Even though he saw in his mother a kind of rebirth, it had even pleasantly surprised him at one point. But the thought of Kate no longer with them brought him back to a harsh reality where there was no room for any positivity. 
Still, he instinctively got up from his chair and walked over to his mother. Tim put his arms around her and whispered, It's not your fault. Don't torture yourself. I love you. November replaced December, and later winter replaced spring. It was especially painful for Kate's family to spend time in the backyard of the house, the very and noisy realm of children where Kate loved to spend time. Both Tim and his parents, after visiting the yard a few times, decided not to go there anymore. They began to avoid the place, but time inexorably went on and on, turning fresh wounds into scars, fresh memories into nothing. Kate grew up and grew good. When she turned 15, her mother's books and an old television with two channels were not enough for her. The girl had no friends, no phone. She was a recluse, and if her mother wasn't around, she would have gone feral. Mary began to get sick more often. She was in her 61st year. Her only help and doctor was her daughter Kate. She had left inside her this fear for her favorite and only creature on earth. And in seven years she had never made friends or even acquaintances. And if Kate was enough for her, and she replaced her friend, companion, helper, and psychologist, then the young, beautiful girl just longed for new acquaintances and a new, modern, comfortable life. Mary let her go to the city more and more often, but asked her to be quiet, careful, and not to contact anyone. The girl spent time at the movies, in cafes, in shopping malls. Fortunately, her mother was able to give her money for such entertainment. Someone threw quite a decent amount of money into her account every month, and she also wrote research papers and articles to order. One day it happened. Kate made a friend. The guy's name was Jack. He was from the city and a little older than her. Kate told her mother that she was walking alone in the city, but she was in the company of a nice young man. When Jack found out that her friend didn't have a cell phone, he briefly bought her one as a gift as a token of friendship. When her mother found out about such a careless purchase, she was displeased, almost becoming furious. Kate, we agreed. No cell phones. She was indignant. But I'm an adult. I have a different outlook on life. And what are yours? Tell me, Mary asked in a mocking tone. I think you can't hide from people. I don't understand why we've been doing this for so many years. I've explained it to you. We're being chased by people, dangerous people. By the way, Mary had told Kate a lot of things in those seven years, often things that had nothing to do with reality. Once you deceive someone, it's easier to deceive them again. So a whole chain of lies builds up. Mary did not notice how this style of communication with her daughter became habitual for her. So Kate became dishonest with her too. As she grew up, she asked herself questions she couldn't find answers to. And slowly it became clear to her Mary has long been deceiving her. Lately, the girl even became annoyed by the excessive care about her, constant warnings and advice, which sounded like an order phrases I'm worried about you. You are my only native person, and I wish you only good. Being always something comforting and kind began to push her away. Dangerous people. What kind of people are they? Maybe you mean your daughter. What daughter? Mary, having asked Kate about it, immediately realized that Kate meant her alcoholic mother, and she was quick to correct herself. Anne, I was beginning to forget she was my daughter at all. This conversation had been on her mind for a long time. She didn't understand how you could love your granddaughter and forget that you had a daughter. She now had even more distrust for the man she was living with. This whole picture of life was no longer comfortable and familiar to her. Kate, like a bird, wanted to flutter out of this not-so-golden cage and flutter away. More and more often she imagined her father, her brother, and her mother. Kate missed them. Kate began to see Jack more and more often. And now she was taking English classes, and she was both scared and pleased to finally feel socialized with people her age young students and college girls, and professors who were all educated and interesting individuals. She finally had the opportunity to socialize and came to this decision on her own. Kate was cramped in a village where the most interesting entertainment was watching an old TV with two barely working channels. They met after the course and went to the park. 
It was springtime beautiful outside. People were observing the most lush blooming of nature. It was the beginning of May. Jack had heard some things about Mary and didn't always understand her and Kate's relationship. He was interested in his girlfriend's life and one day decided to have a serious conversation with her. Kate, didn't I get it right? She's not your birth mother. She's my grandmother. She once asked me to call her mom. I did. Don't you miss yours? I do. But if I leave, she can't stand it. She once said if I left, I shouldn't come back. Kate, it's all manipulation. You have to realize that. What does that mean? Kate read fiction. Science fiction, of course. But she sometimes lacked versatile communication. She didn't know many modern phrases, trends, fashions. Jack was for her a savior in this world everything that seemed strange to the girl. For example, when watching a movie, she would clarify with her friend. That means, Kate, she controls her emotions, she knows you feel sorry for her and presses on. Yes, she does. But what do we do? Do you want to see your family? I want to see my brother. I don't know if I want to see the people who ruined my childhood. My grandmother saved me from them. But she stole you. Jack's sudden conclusion shook Kate's mind. She thought for the first time that Mary's act could, in fact, be considered a kidnapping. I did, but she said it was best for me. I was beaten, Jack, they drank. They were never interested. I understand that. But you also understand. She had no right to do that to those people. That day was the first time Kate had ever thought so deeply about the possible feelings of her first family. What if they're still hurting? What if they're looking for me? What if Grandma hadn't discussed anything with them? Jack's words were now unsettling, and it seemed he was right. Kate was determined to do what she wanted. But how could she make sure that her grandmother, to whom she owed so much, was not offended? One beautiful May evening they had a conversation. Kate went on and on about how much she would like to see her brother Tim, but she could see that her grandmother did not want to talk about relatives. I've been wanting to ask you for a long time. Why didn't you take Tim with us? He's your grandson too. He was a big boy. He wouldn't have gone. I talked to him. He made his decision. But why would you want to take away my ability to communicate with him? Kate, this is hard for me to talk about. Mary realized that Kate was backing her into a corner with this kind of questioning. What was she to say about a teenage boy she'd only seen a couple times? The woman's lies as the girl's curiosity grew more and more sophisticated. I want to go to them. I will. Kate cut her off decisively. No, it's out of the question. You and I have talked about it. You're not going to take me back. If I come, are you going to kick me out? No, no, no. Emotionally, the woman shouted. After a moment, having calmed down and taken a breath, she answered much quieter than before, as if to close the subject of all the girl's long-standing requests and complaints. They are dead. All of them. What? That can't be. Kate stood up from her chair pale. But it is. Mary, sitting on the chair in front of the dining table, rested her face in her palms. She wasn't crying. She wasn't hiding her tears, as people who want their emotions not to be seen by those around them usually do. She was hiding the absence of tears. She was hiding the shame of another lie. Another ten years passed. Kate was twenty-five. At that age, she had to experience another, the most bitter loss of her life. Her own beloved grandmother had died. Though her identity was surrounded by more and more secrets with each passing year, Kate loved her sometimes strange, sometimes cruel, but very loving and caring grandmother Mary. By this time, the girl had already had a serious relationship with Jack, the very guy who often spurred her to assert her rights in dealing with her grandmother. As cynical as it may sound, but only after Mary's death, Kate decided to take the step that her beloved had been waiting for her for five whole years. She said yes, and it was two days after the funeral. Mary still to the end of her life accepted Jack, because she understood the girl will need care and support. After all, except for a real grandmother and a young man, she had no one in this world. At least she convinced her of that. Kate, 
having arrived in her native cozy little house, where she grew up and comprehended life through books and communication with Grandma Mary, was happy and sad. She realized I was entering a new life, but it was like something was keeping her dumb. And it wasn't just the death of a dear and close person. Kate felt that the death of her grandmother did not close all her spiritual worries and eternal state of anxiety. Her heart was still out of place. Both mind and body had been calling to Kate always, ever since the day of Mary's death. And here she was, surrounded by objects and furniture that had once been so familiar to her. And she had learned the roughness, holes, and irreducible stains of each. Strangely, the girl caught herself thinking that she had never laid or even sat on her grandmother's bed. She slowly walked over to it and sat down on it. That dark green bedspread that her grandmother used to cover her bed with. That red patterned rug that always gave the house a special atmosphere and coziness. The same one hung in the girl's apartment in Moscow. Those intricate figures on the carpet always brought the girl back to the past. She went deeper and advanced so that her back rested against the log wall. Kate threw her head back and cried. She was to be married soon. But somehow doubts were creeping into her soul. The girl did not want to start a new page of life, not yet having sorted out the old ones. In her soul hung a lot of questions about what happened to her relatives. Why did her grandmother took her so far away, and why did she worry only about her? Kate wanted answers to all these questions, and those answers came. After she calmed down and wiped away her tears with her hand, she turned to the wall and saw something white between the logs. It was deeply hidden. And yet, as if on purpose, part of this object peeked out a little inside the gap. Kate tried to get it out, but failed. Then she found a pair of scissors in her grandmother's old jewelry box. With them, she grasped the edge and pulled out the whole thing. It was a piece of paper folded in four. Having discovered an interesting find, the girl hurried with it to the light. She sat down by the window and unfolded the sheet. Kate immediately recognized the familiar handwriting. It was Grandma Mary's. Her hands were covered with cold sweat and even trembled slightly. She didn't know the contents of the letter, of course, and couldn't even guess what it would say. But somehow she felt that her life would change dramatically after reading it. Kate read the following lines. Dear Kate, you know and see how sick I am. Every day could be my last. I try to see you more often, to see your smile and how happy you are. Yes, I want to tell you again that, excepting your Jack, there is so much I want to tell you right now, but unfortunately I am. Pathetic and cowardly, I only ask one thing of you. Let this be my last will and testament. Don't blame or curse me for what I'm about to tell you now. I'm not your grandmother or your mother. I am nothing to you. But I loved you very much when I saw you on the playground. You were an angel to me then, and you still are. I'm an unfortunate man. An unhappy woman who has met betrayal, deceit, and pain along the way. I could never have children. The man I loved left me. And we lived together for twenty years. You appeared to me just at the moment when the darkness in my soul closed everything alive. I'm grateful for that. But I've been lying to you all this time. I saw how worried you were about your family. I know who left you with those bruises on your face and your body. And I so didn't want them to do it again. My heart is breaking for you. I'm a liar. I stole you, kidnapped you, they were all looking for you, Kate. I know that. But the worst and most important thing I lied about is that your brother, your mother, and your father, they're alive. Yes, they're alive. They still live in Moscow. If you've forgiven them, go there soon. Being a mother is the greatest value in life. I've experienced it because of you. Kate sat on the bed for several minutes in a state of complete stupor. She couldn't believe the words that were written on the piece of paper. She didn't want to believe that her grandmother had cruelly deceived her all these years. And at the same time, it was as if she had learned what she had longed to know. All the secrets that had been keeping her in suspense were revealed to her. She'd basically gotten what she wanted. And now she was ready, probably, to burn this message and erase her memory, killing all desire to know the truth. The girl didn't cry. 
which seemed strange to her. She tried to squeeze a single tear out of herself, but failed. Now her mind was dominated by the thought of going to her relatives. Three days after the bitter discovery in the gap between the logs of the wall, she decided to go. Kate packed her backpack, already texting Jack. Jack, my family's alive. I'm going to Moscow. I'll be there in a few days or weeks. I'll explain everything. I'll tell you later. Kate sat at the small table in the kitchen where she had once had tea with her grandmother. She had decided that all her life, Mary would be remembered as her own. The resentment toward her lasted a few hours, and later all that remained was pity. She crouched on the walkway, her things already waiting for her in the hallway. The girl looked through the unwashed window of the courtyard. It would seem that she had waited so long for this moment. She had despaired so much when she learned of the death of her loved ones, and even regretted holding blackness in her heart toward her mother and father. She was so relieved when she realized they were all alive, but something seemed to be stopping her from making the trip. What it was, she couldn't quite put her finger on. It happens, and you can't do anything about it. When feelings blossom inside you, bad or good or otherwise, but they're so strongly rooted in your head that every day, from waking up to falling asleep, you hear them, feel them, live with them. And a similar strong feeling came over Kate. She couldn't figure out what it was. Fear, or resentment, or rejection. But it was strong. Taking up a sea of energy, a feeling. She thought, whatever the deception was, everything that has happened to me since I was kidnapped and moved to the boys has led me to what is happening to me today. She was happy with Jack. Her soul and mind remained pure and not corrupted by city life. She glanced at her watch. She had already missed the first bus to town. 